10 years ago, I was standing at the point where this happened. It's one of those villages which are all fairly close to each other in that part of the world called Galilee. Naim. And if one looks up at that point to the unchanged blue sky, one sees power. That power the Son of God invoked and over which he himself had power. That same power which we invoke at the Epiclesis at Holy Mars when the priest also raises up his eyes to heaven and spreads out his hand over the gifts. That same Holy Ghost, that same power is in our midst. We have power. We also have power in the realm of knowledge, for precisely we are in contact with the Logos. We have a revealed religion. We know where we are going. That was not the case when New Grange, which is fairly near to where I live, was built. 500 years or so before the pyramids. They didn't know where they were going. And so they had an insurance policy. Let's trap the most powerful thing we have, rays of the sun. And they did so pretty well to be our each year. But we have the Son of Justice and we follow him, not into the unknown. In school days, I was reading way back when still an evangelical Baptist, bits of Be the Venerable. And in the seventh book of the Ecclesiastical History of the English Nation, he has this description that he had got from an eyewitness. It's what happened to Frithel. A good enough man, but he died. And rather like this young man in the Gospel, he sat up just before they put his body in the ground. Ah! Oh, he's alive! Actually, he hadn't been alive. He'd been given a guided tour. And he came back with the news. And the result of the guided tour was that he came back with vengeance. The Eternal Father had congratulated him on making it, but had given him the choice. Having seen what you have seen, which do you wish? To come back in straight away or to come back in later on, having done more before you get here? And immediately he opted to come back because he saw the value of time, merit and penance. And in his second life, he did atrocious penance that others might not lose their soul and go to one of the places that we've seen, what has been called Casa Carta, the hot house. And there were people there that should never have been there, priests and the like. He was shown purgatory, which by the way was uncomfortable for me to read as a Protestant, but he was seeing it, and it also was giving him to understand the power of certain things to help people in there. And one thing was the power of what we're doing right now, the Holy Sacrifice. Ouch! That was uncomfortable for the Protestant to read. And eventually, the pearly gates. Wow! So, I want to take you by the hand, my brethren, and give you a little guided tour today. Are you sitting uncomfortably? Then I shall begin. I start with that question which was puzzling in the Purgatory Manuscript, which later on, years later, I found and translated. Are many Protestants saved? There are, through God's gracious mercy, a certain number of Protestants who are saved, but their purgatory is lengthy and in many cases rigorous. It's true, notice this bit, that they haven't abused graces like many Catholics. The abuse of grace, my friends, is our big danger. We take it for granted 
and we abuse it greatly. Typical Catholic sins, bad language, and on and on we could go. But it is also true that they haven't had the singular graces of the sacraments and the other aids of the true religion. The result being that their expiation is protracted at length in purgatory. Okay, I'm going to jump now. The non-alive wants to know what's going on on the other side, obviously. Answer. It's impossible for me to explain to you how it is that we no longer see the world as you do. This can't be understood before the soul has left the body. Because once that has happened, the world that is just left behind by abandoning its body to it, no longer seems to it as anything more than a dot. Compared with the endless horizons of eternity that open out before it. Now, remember that bit when you have a big problem. Collocate that problem within that dot. The wider picture should help you to relativize any problem. Because the only irreversible problem, the only big time tragedy is to get to that point of the beginning of eternity and realize as one sees in the picture in the Sistine Chapel of the soul who realized, I haven't made it. And all eternity lies before it. We can avoid a lengthy purgatory by certain secrets, well understood in time. Some souls, says the soul in there, do their purgatory on earth through suffering. Remember that bit before complaining. You have a choice. Complain and lose your merit, or offer your body to Jesus and say, Lord, extend your passion in me. It might be that you are in perpetual pain, if not today, later on, at a later stage in your life. And you might be asked to be, yes, a victim soul, able to do nothing else but suffer. I've known a few of these. One, whom I prepared for death. I have a picture before me in the sacristy at home. Anna never ever suffered in pain, but always smiled and beamed and told little jokes. And the last time I saw her, just a few days before she petered out, I just anointed her, and her phone went, and a family member asked, how are you? And all she said was, not great. Others through love. Remember now, it's been noted that souls who love well and don't hurt others have a fast track on the other side. Because love too has its own very real martyrdom. Now this operates on two levels. The soul that seeks to love Jesus in truth finds, in spite of its efforts, that it doesn't love him as it would wish to. And it is for this soul a perpetual martyrdom caused by love alone and not without acute pains. That's referring to the parallel between that and the last stage of purgatory, which is the purgatory of desire. There's no more pain of the senses, it's only pain of the soul and suffering. Desire. It goes into the whole field of the lowest level of purgatory where souls shouldn't really be there, they should have gone further down, but something in the mercy of God has just helped them, often through someone else's help. And they 
end up there initially looking a bit like demons with still the instincts of evil inside them, but they say to themselves, only the lowest level of purgatory. And they're very close, very close. It has been said, and I've told you before, that that level and hell work on the same heating system. Martyrdom. Right now, in Poland, not in a cathedral, but in a village, a whole family is being beatified. Martyrs of charity. Nearly all the Jews had been rounded up by the Nazis in that part of Poland, but there were very few left, and eight went to these charitable Christians, a very fervent couple. The husband, Joseph, was 12 years older than Victoria, his young wife. He was 44 and she was 32 pregnant with her seventh child, I think, at least sixth. And they had taken in these eight Jews and put them in the attic. But a local police officer had let on to the Nazis. And at four o'clock in the morning, they came in, got the eight from the attic, shot them immediately, and then, proceeded also to shoot the husband, the wife who started to give labor, to go into labor at that point, and all the children. The child who was seven months in the womb, I think came out but didn't survive. And on this day, all of them are being beatified, including the little infant baptized in his, it was a boy, in his own blood. And we see from the pictures, because he was an amateur photographer, that it was a very Christian loving family. They loved themselves and each other intensely and there was only warmth in the family. And indeed, the cousin of one of the girls, now beatified, gave testimony recently that they were in school together, and the good teacher had proposed to the boys to make little cradles, and to the girls to make little dolls. And he made his for his cousin, and she, by that time, couldn't put the bambino, the boy doll, in the cradle, because she was no more. These, my friends, were martyrs of charity. The Jews, of course, were cut off to Auschwitz and the like, but there were other martyrs of charity, including Edith Stein, and of course, Maximilian Maria Kolbe. I'll go in his place. I have no family. The atrocious, prolonged death of hunger and thirst. And he himself prepared in the same bunker those who were dying before him, and he had to be given a lethal injection because he wouldn't die. I said Mark's after the nation at the very altar when he'd said his first. What a grace. Wait, now I want to move to someone else who knows a bit about the other side. Fortunately, Maria Sima was interviewed before she died by Sister Emanuela of the Beatitudes. What happens at death? A lot, my friends. A lot that we don't actually know or see. The frontier prolongs itself for a few seconds after we have lost contact with them. And there things happen that we can't see. In the Hell Management that I translated, there is that indication that that is the case, because the girl who was alive and wore this one was in a bad state about certain things, but she had told her that according to some holy woman who had this revelation, no one goes to hell who doesn't actually choose to go there. And this other one, who was misbehaving, 
said to herself, even though she made fun of her, well, that means I've got a chance at the last minute. And then what happened was, it was a Sunday, she heard this plea in her heart, you could perhaps go to Mars one last time. And what happened was there, the whole proclivity of the soul just carried on as it had for a long time. And the habit of saying no to grace at that She has come up in exorcism in Germany in the same series as Adolf Hitler came up as well. It's rather sad, isn't it? But one who sent so many people to the gas chambers didn't gain anything from a place in history. Whereas the ones he went to send to their, into their gas chambers and into being shot and tortured got there like rockets. Which matters, a name in history or a name in divine history? And many work for a name in history, a name on the screen, a name nowadays on the smartphone and on the computer, followers and limelight that are not in a good place should they die. And so, Maria Silva indicates that there is, it would seem, now she thinks it's about two to three minutes when all is in the balance, because the Lord doesn't want any soul to go to eternal loss, separation from him, the Lord that entails, without having had one moment of lucidity to see what's in the balance. But, and again it comes through, what happens is that again the natural proclivity of the soul carries on. And as it's done before, at that point too, it carries on. And then it realizes, too late then, it hasn't made it. Now do you see how clever the enemy of the soul is? All he wants is souls. Anything that works, he'll use it. Distract them, distract them, distract them. And how easy it is today to distract souls. It's all in their pocket, it's all on the screen, it's all in the airways, it's all all around but in their soul. No one can be still. Put a soul on its own now, and what would it do? Fidget. Even at night, it can't be alone with its thoughts. They're easy prey for the one who wants the honour of their company forevermore. But there are, and I'll just finish with this, consoling bits as well. We can help. This case, amongst many others, of a person who was on the train with Maria Sidman. He spent all the journey lashing out against God and the church. She was courteous, didn't say anything, but when she was getting off, she indicated to him, you have no right to be saying these things, and left it at that. However, she made a pact with the Lord. She was not going to let this soul go. She pleaded with the Lord, that he would have mercy on that soul and not let it be lost. A good while later, this soul came to her and said to her, if it had not been for that prayer that you made, I would now be in hell. We know from exorcism that this subject must not be discussed. It is a conspiracy of silence plotted by hell. Because the less it's talked about, the more it fills up. So beware, my friends, of PC.
because no amount of PC can save a soul. Penance and prayer and sacrifice and the good use of the sacraments 